Welcome to the first episode in my series on asynchronous web applications in Python. I'm calling it ASCII Fundamentals. We will cover FastAPI, Starlet, and a few other very important libraries. However, FastAPI does way too much magic to really understand from a top-down approach. Even if you go to definition and try to read the source code, there's a lot of implicit understanding that they don't spell out. We've got fancy decorators that somehow map paths to endpoints. We just return a Python object and it somehow gets converted into an HTTP response. We've got pattern matching inside of paths that somehow turns into arguments to the function. And not to mention using Pydantic for custom models and schema, routers, sub-applications, exceptions, background tasks, and even the little things like authentication. But thankfully, you don't need more and more specific tutorials to tell you how to do every little thing in FastAPI. What you need is a tutorial that teaches you the fundamentals. That's my goal for what this series is meant to be. All right, let's start as low as we can go with the fundamental building blocks and go up from there. To start, you're going to need to know how to raise your own goats. Wait, no, that's a different tutorial. The first thing you need to understand is the ASGI specification. That's ASGI, A-S-G-I, not ASCII. Once you finish this video, you're going to go to this website here. I'll put a link down below. And you're going to read the entire ASCII specification. And then you're going to read it again. And then you're going to bookmark it because you're going to be coming back to it again and again and again. It's not that long, it's like a 10 to 15 minute read, and it defines the standard, the ASCII standard, for how a server is gonna call into an asynchronous Python application. Under the hood, all the asynchronous Python frameworks are building off of this standard, so you really need to read it. So what is the purpose of this standard in the first place? Here's an artist's depiction of some data that might be sent to a web application. Convert it to bytes and ship it. This is pretty much exactly what a message to a server might look like. But if I'm building a Python web app, this is not really the level of data that I wanna be working with. I don't want just this one big long thing as a string or bytes object. Could I write a parser for this? Yeah, probably. Would I make a mistake? Yeah, probably. And don't you dare even think of trying to do it with regular expressions especially since HTTP has a lot of corner cases and you might end up trying to parse a request that looks something more like this than the easier example. Instead of making application authors worry about all the corner cases of HTTP and parsing, let's define an interface. Let's define a standard for the kind of results that we wanna see in Python when we get a message like this and how to communicate those results to and from the outside world. Well, great news, that part's already done. It's called ASCII. So what does ASCII tell me about what an application looks like? The ASCII spec puts most of the heavy lifting onto the developers of the protocol server, something like UVCorn, which is in charge of handling all the web requests, connections, raw HTTP data, stuff like that. But for the application author, they make it incredibly simple. An ASCII application is a single asynchronous callable. That's it. It always has the same three parameters, a scope dictionary that defines the scope of a connection, an asynchronous receive function for receiving events from a client, and an asynchronous send function for sending events to a client. We've raised the level of abstraction away from raw bytes, and instead our primitives are now these event messages that are dictionaries, real Python dictionaries. All event messages have a specific type, and different types of messages have different other fields. The application callable is called once per connection. The scope tells you the details of the connection, and within a single connection, you can receive and send multiple different messages. A connection could be a single HTTP request response cycle, where I first receive all of the client data, I come up with my response, and then I send it to them. If they're uploading a big file, I might receive many events before I send anything back. Or if I'm streaming data to them, I might receive just a few events and then send many events. Or a connection could be a lot longer lived, like a WebSocket connection. All right, let's start building up our very first ASCII application. We define our async def callable. It takes scope, receive, and send. I've taken the liberty of type hinting these already. You can pause here and take a look at the definitions if you want, although they're pretty straightforward. So a scope is just a dictionary, a message is just a dictionary, 
the receive is something that you await to get a message, and the send is something that you give a message to and then await in order to send it. The most popular server for ASCII applications is Ubicorn, so we're going to be using that. That's going to be the thing that takes raw HTTP stuff and then converts it into this scope, receive, and send for us. All this app does is count how many connections it's received and print out the scope. We use a global to keep track of how many connections we've seen, and then we just print whenever we start and end the current connection, which since we're not receiving or sending any messages is going to be really fast. Let's go ahead and bring up our terminal in order to run it. You can see as soon as I start the application, I immediately get one connection. Now this is not a real connection. This has a special type called lifespan. This is like a fake connection that the application uses in order to do startup and shutdown things. We can see a real connection by sending a curl request though. Of course, we get an error because we didn't actually implement anything, but the main thing that I want to note is the scope here. So this is what the scope of an actual HTTP request looks like. We have some version info about you know, which version of ASCII it's using. We're using HTTP 1.1, server and client host and port. The scheme is like HTTP or HTTPS. Then we have the HTTP method, like get, post, put, or delete. This root path is for when you have an application that isn't mounted at the root of the URL. Don't worry about this one for now. And then we have the path and raw path. I don't know why they felt the need to give us both of them. I think the raw one is actually optional. It splits off the query string, which came from here. Then of course we have all of our headers for the HTTP request. And finally, we have this state dictionary. So this actually is just a copy of this state dictionary. During startup, you'll get this lifespan startup connection. You can put state in there, and then that state will just get copied, a shallow copy given to each request. In order to make our app functional, we need to just look at the type of these connections that are coming in, and then handle different ones based off of their types. So here's what I'll do. I'll just paste this in check the type of the scope, and if I see a lifespan type, then I'll basically pass everything down to a separate handler that handles just that type of connection. Or if I see an HTTP event, then I'll send it to a separate HTTP handler. I give both of these the same scope, receive, and send that the main application received, because both of these are basically acting like their own little sub-applications that are just receiving messages tailored for them. Let's head on up and write the lifespan one. Remember, this scope that has a type of lifespan is supposed to represent a connection that spans the entire life of the program. With that in mind, I'm basically waiting for two events, a startup and a shutdown. This time when we run the server, we again see the lifespan connection, but we also see the first message, which is the startup message. The application won't accept any other requests until startup finishes, so if I try to curl it again, I'll actually get a failed to connect. And it's actually a little bit worse than that. You'll notice that if I try to kill it with control C, it actually won't even shut down. This only seems to happen if you don't complete the startup process correctly. Normally you can control C to kill it, uh, but for now we'll just have to kill minus nine. Okay, and there we go. To complete the startup process successfully, we basically just have to listen for the startup event and send a startup complete when we receive it. Similarly, to prevent badness when shutting down, we listen for the shutdown event and then send a shutdown complete. Now this is using receive and send, but this is not receiving and sending to an actual client. This is just talking to the protocol server. Starting the server again, this time we'll get some info messages because we actually completed the startup. And if we control C to quit and go back up, then you'll see that we actually handled the shutdown event right when we did the control C as well. Okay, so how do we handle an HTTP connection? Well, let's start off by just seeing what kind of messages we receive. Back to the server and do a curl request. And then so far we just get one message that is an HTTP request that has an empty body. But if you look closely, curl has not actually completed here. It's hanging, sort of waiting for the response from the server, and the server is hanging, waiting for curl to finish. So I'm just going to go ahead and kill this, and we're going to see something a little bit weird. When I did a control C on curl, that closed the connection. Once the connection is closed, if you ever try to await receive a message, you'll always get this HTTP disconnect message. 
This isn't something the client has to actively send to you. If the connection is closed one way or another, then every time you await receive it, you'll always get the same disconnect message. Okay, so lesson learned, if we ever receive one of these HTTP disconnect messages, then we should break out. Now we run our server and run the curl again. And this time when we kill it, it just immediately ends. But the real problem here was that we kept waiting for a message, even though the client said there was no more body. If we see that they don't have any more body to send, then we break out of the while loop. Our response is basically made up of two messages. The first is a start message where we put the status code and the headers. Let's just print that out and then await and send that message. Then let's immediately follow it up with the body of the response. Regardless of whatever they sent us, we'll just hit them with a K. Then go ahead and send that. So this now represents the entire lifecycle of an HTTP connection request. So we get the request coming in, we receive the entire message, uh, potentially multiple messages. If they disconnect, then we stop. Once they say there's no more message, then we go ahead and start sending a response where we just respond with a 200 and hit them with a K. All right, let's see it in action. Start it up again, curl, and there it is, K. In the logs here, we see after we received their last message, we start sending the response and we get an info message from UVCorn saying it recognized that we sent a 200 OK for that request. Let's try sending a post request next. This one, I think it's pretty representative of a typical username and password that we see in the wild. Once again, we responded with a K, but before we did that, we can at least verify that we see the body of the message contained that username and password. Um, and we see in the headers that it was form URL encoded content type and that it was a post request. I'm not trying to fool anyone. It's not pretty, but I hope you can see that at the very least, you can piece together the most basic version of something that might resemble a real production application. I can say, oh, okay, I received an HTTP message for a specific path. If it was slash echo, then use this handler. If it was slash status, then use this other handler. If it was a post request, use this endpoint. If it was a get request, use that endpoint. I have the information here to at least respond to requests in the way that a normal application would that you're familiar with. That would look something like this. I just check the scope and see if the path is to slash echo with a post request, then I'll call an echo endpoint and pass in the same scope receive send. If I see a request for slash status, that's a get request, then I call some other endpoint. You could even do something like try to match the path against a regular expression, and then use the captures of the regular expression, the groups in the regular expression, and pass those as extra arguments to the endpoint. Huh starting to feel a lot like what the big frameworks are doing, doesn't it? Well, it's no surprise this is basically exactly what a fast API router is. It's just a smaller ASCII application that's being called by a bigger one. And if you were to look into all these endpoints, you would notice a lot of commonality, like how they receive all their request data and how they send all their response data. Whenever I send a response, I always send a response start, a status, maybe a content type here, and then I send the body. Well, let's take a look at the Starlet response object. So if you're not familiar with Starlet, a fast API application basically inherits from one of these Starlet applications. Let's take a look at the response type in Starlet. So this is Starlet code. The plain text response inherits from response and sets a media type. So what is response? Let's scroll down, render, and it headers. Headers, set cookie, delete cookie, where is it? Ah, we have a dunder call. And what do you know? It's an async def function. It takes a scope, a receive, and a send. And what does it do? It sends two messages. A response start with the status code and headers, and then a body with a body. All of the response objects in Starlet, and therefore in FastAPI as well, are not much more than just little wrappers around sending these two messages and then maybe doing a background task afterwards. We've barely started to put the pieces together. By no means is this a complete picture, but I hope this is enough to show you my vision. My vision for the series is to help you understand from the ground up these building blocks. 
That way, when there's some feature that Fast API doesn't have or that it does have and it just doesn't quite work the way that you want it to, you're not stuck. You won't be limited to copy pasting simple examples you've seen online. If you understand the fundamentals, you can build something great on your own. If you especially like my content, the best way to support the channel is to become a patron on Patreon. So thank you to all my patrons and donors for supporting the channel. My company also does code reviews, contracting, training, and consulting. Check us out at mcoding.io.